powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia studio, this is Football at Four. And Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And, of course, it is brought to you today by our friends at the Gallery Bar Book and Games in Ocean Casino Resort this football season. Cheer your favorite drinks while cheering on your favorite team. Go to the Gallery in Ocean Casino Resort. Go for the win. For more information, visit OceanAC.com. Must be 21 or older to play gambling problem. Call 1-800-GAMBLER. We'll be there live on Monday for the Eagles and the Vikings over at Ocean Casino Resort. Stop out and see us. Watch the Eagles live. And we'll take you till 6 o'clock right now. We got football at 4. Jeff Mosher is here as uh, Inside the Birds has plenty of information on this Eagles win. And uh, obviously a lot of people talking, Jeff, about uh, the quarterback and the defense. But if I was to ask you, what is the biggest question you have from game one going into game number two? Do those two guys or do those two things, the quarterback and the defense, are they high on your list? The highest one on my list. And when you say defense, I think the big topics of conversation the last day or two is run defense. Um, But under discussed probably in light of who's coming up on the schedule also is the fact that there was not a whole lot of pressure on Jared Goff. And there also wasn't, and when you watch the tape, Mike, there, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff done on the back end that you would think would be designed to confuse a quarterback. I know Jonathan Gannon blitzed a little bit more, and I I think because he did it a little more than usual, it probably stood out and felt like he blitzed a lot. I think it was only six times when all was said and done. Um, Not much in the second half. And um, when you're not going to blitz, you've got to – you have to do two things if you're going to play softer coverage, Mike. You've got to use the athleticism you have on your defensive line to do things like twisting, stunting, called line games. You know, try to – try to catch the offensive line off guard and use your guys like Hassan Reddick who can move around and other guys like that moving laterally and, and try to get a, free him up to get a, a good look at the quarterback. Or you do stuff on the back end, right? You either tighten up your coverage with your corners or you bring your safeties uh, down to the box, make it look like it's man defense cover one, but drop them into cover two, vice versa. And there just wasn't real, a real whole lot of that. And I would think after all the additions this offseason – and knowing that that wasn't a big part of the defense last year, and now you're going up against, you know, if you thought if you thought Jared Goff had too much time to throw to guys like DJ Chark and um, Amon Ross St. Brown, imagine when those guys become Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. Yeah, they got uh, much more talent. You know, that's the thing. And this is where this whole, like, the defense didn't do this and that didn't do that. The matchups, the styles make the fights, and – Detroit doesn't have great skill guys. They've got solid skill guys. Um, but Minnesota's got better skill guys. The difference is, I think Detroit's got a better offensive line. Minnesota, their offensive line, especially in the interior, struggles a little bit. So while they have better skill position guys, you should be able to get mm-hmm. more pressure against the Minnesota defense uh, offensive line. Yeah, so the concern would only be then, though, um, as we saw last year, even some teams that didn't have great offensive lines – but had smart quarterbacks and good throwing quarterbacks were able to beat the Eagles because they knew what they wanted to do with the ball before the ball was snapped because the coverage, there was nothing disguising, nothing cunning about it. So, so Kirk cousins and uh, his weapons and that running game that they have can set up play action, which can also help give you added uh, time to throw the ball. That would be my concern is that they're going to dictate offensively, what they're going to do against the Eagles and mitigate the pressure that the Eagles should get by just having a quicker trigger and um, a, you know a stronger idea of when to mix the run, the pass, and when they're who they're going to throw to before the ball is snapped. You know, uh, one of the things in this game, I want to get your opinion on this because Adam, you know, was on yesterday with us and uh, people talking about Jordan Davis should he got more playing time and. Uh, you know, what is your thoughts on the way they use Davis and will that materialize as the season goes on? Or is that what you think most people should expect? 22 plays, usually as a run stuff mm-hmm. or short yardage situations. Or is there a bigger role for him somewhere down the line this year? Well, first of all, I think I want a Mia Culpa for my Monday interview with you at 4 o'clock. Uh, tape watching is a heck of a thing. And, you know, we call overreaction Monday a reason for it. But I don't think I was overreactive compared to what you hear out there. But 
um, after watching the tape and sort of talking to some people and, and putting things in normal perspective, the tape really shows you that <laughs> sometimes stats can be skewed. For example, I know the stats said that when Jordan Davis is in the game, that the run defense did phenomenally better compared to when he was not in the game. However, with a big guy like that who's in the game, say, on goal line situations or in short yardage situations when the running back can only gain a certain number of yards anyway, that's going to skew the stats. Yeah. And I did see on tape plenty of times when Jordan Davis was on the field, did his job, but the running back still got 7, 10, 20 yard run. There were still good runs by the Lions even when Jordan Davis was in the game. So my, my feeling on Jordan Davis is we can have a discussion about how much he's going to play. Can it be more? Why isn't it more? We'll get that. But as I, as I wrote, you know, no, no one person is single-handedly going to cure the things that ailed the Eagles' run defense against the Lions. It is going to have to be a much more collective effort, uh, and it shouldn't absolve guys like Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave from doing their jobs. I, I don't think they did a very good job in run defense. Um, and then, of course, your back-end players, linebackers, safeties, corners, did not do a good job either. So you can put Jordan Davis out there for 100 snaps, and he can be bionic. But if he redirects the running back and forces a cutback, but the other guys don't tackle him, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, I guess, okay. you know, the thought process, you know, because th this is an interesting conversation we can kind of get into. You know, are mm -hmm. the Eagles small? Like, other linebackers? I mean, we've had some questions in the past, like, ah, their linebackers are small. They're not playmakers. Part of the thing was, hey, Jordan Davis will take up all these blockers. The linebackers shouldn't have <laughs> blockers on them, and they should be able to be free to make tackles. So, yeah, I mean, yes, yes, of course they are. They've always been. But, I mean, Kaiser White, we love how fast he runs and his coverage ability. Um, he's was supposedly a good – I remember having this conversation with you. Apparently he was a great tackler last year with the Chargers, right? And I remember saying to you, you have to evaluate a player within the context of the scheme that he's playing within. Because we've seen other guys come here to try to play positions, whether it was Will Parks or, you know, Eric Wilson or whatever, Anthony Harris being in a different scheme, having good numbers, but then coming here and it's not the same. So, but Kaiser White is not a downhill linebacker. And the Lions were smart. They lined up and they tried to run at those kind of guys. And look, one of their safeties – Chauncey Gardner Johnson is like a big cornerback, if we're being fair. He's not a good in the box tackler. And so the Lions knew that and they took advantage of that and capitalized on that. So, yeah, they're small. And uh, theoretically, when Jordan Davis is on the field, he's much bigger and he will make it very difficult to run into certain gaps when he's on there. But for those who keep saying, get him on the field more, get him on the field more, like you don't just snap your fingers and make things happen. And the coaches don't just not play players. For the heck of it, you know, as a first round pick, I'm sure they would love to be able to use him more. But at Georgia, we, we've had this discussion a million times. He did not play a lot of snaps at Georgia. He is a very large human being. He is not conditioned to play in an NFL game. And it's not just conditioning. That's one part of it. Um, he's not ready. You know, he's got a lot of technique. He's got to work out. He's got a lot of uh, angle form. You know, you lose your pad leverage when you're out there a couple of snaps in a row and you get tired. And he's the type of guy who can't lose his pad leverage. So, there's just work to be done with him. And if you're a coaching staff and you know that you can play Jordan Davis for X amount of snaps, kind of like a pitcher getting a pitch count, you don't just go out there and play him all those snaps in the first quarter and then live with the results from second, third, and fourth. You know there's going to be goal line you want him for. There's going to be third and short, fourth and short, and then there's going to be normal base downs that you're going to want him for too. So you got to be able to like get him on the field in those best opportunities. So he's not, again, I'm not saying this is going to be the way it all, all year, but he is a rookie. He is a, a work. He, they're working on him. They even talked a little bit about him when they drafted him, about you have to kind of get him up to speed, get him right, um, get him learning the techniques. Uh, Broderick Bunkley, I think, had the same issue his first year uh, as a defensive tackle. I don't that's think he was on the name. field nearly as much. It's a great name. What's that? So that's a yeah, great yeah. name. Florida State, Broderick Bunkley, baby. Um, That's right. There, there are guys who don't just play right away, yeah. even though they're first round. I mean, Derek were, Barnett didn't play right away. As a were first you surprised? Well, most people are probably happy about that, but uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, real quick, uh, while you brought up Barnett, how how do they um, kind of what do they do in his rotational? Um, Barnett played twelve snaps, which he got hurt, so we don't know how many he would have ended up getting there. But uh, what do they do outside of the organization? Is there someone they like? Do they get creative? How do you see that kind of you know playing out? 
Yeah, I mean, he had an, an odd role in that he was a, you know, drafted to be a pass rusher. But at this stage of the game, they brought him back with a strangely, a strange contract. They gave him more guaranteed money, I thought, to be a backup hand in the dirt pass rusher. So they're down one of those. Teron Jackson can get elevated into that role. They signed this kid from the Vikings practice squad, didn't, who was a fourth round pick, has a lot of traits. They obviously have to build him up. They've got another ro- a roster spot open. We'll see if they fill it. But it, it's really, I don't think from a pass rush standpoint, it impacts him that much because he was really behind the edge rushing chart, behind Hassan Reddick, behind Josh Sweat, behind Brandon Graham. So he was fourth on the list. And um, so that hurts him a little bit from a depth standpoint, but not as much when you also con- consider that they get an interior rush from Cox and Hargrave and Milton Williams. Hey, um, now when you look at we go, you know, Jordan Davis seems to be a big theme here, but the tackle rotation, um, Tupolto played what twenty nine snaps, forty two percent. You had Milton Williams played thirty three snaps, forty eight percent. Hargrave played thirty eight, Fletcher thirty nine. You know, and I thought there was a series late in the game that was interesting where you had the two backup tackles, Marvin and Marlin, yes. together in the fourth quarter in a big spot. Like, and I was wondering, like, is Jordan Davis uh, – not Jordan Davis. Um, John Gannon slowly noticing that his two starters may not be his better two guys and that he's going to make that phase? Do you think that's a possibility? I definitely think, to your point, that those two were in the game at that point because he had more trust in them to get the job done against the run. Ooh, and that's I think interesting. They validated that. But but let's let's that 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 goes to the whole week one context thing. I'm going to take you back to last year, week one, Atlanta. Right? If you remember, the Atlanta Falcons were running the ball down the Eagles' throats last year with both Cordarrelle Patterson and Mike Davis. And at some point, he took out Eric Wilson, and then he took out Alex Singleton. I think was still on the team last year, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And he played he played Sean Bradley. Like he's like just. I'm throwing somebody out there that can make a freaking tackle, or at least that can help me make a tackle. So that's kind of a week one type thing I think he was looking for. And I would say last year, the first six games, they really struggled in run defense because of both the scheme and some of the personnel. And I was surprised. It got better, definitely better when he changed some scheme in linebacker personnel. But there are times where Cox and Hargrave just get pushed around in the run defense, and it's sort of surprising to me. I know that they're mostly pass rushers, and that's their specialty, but they both are very, very strong, country-strong type of guys and should not be getting pushed back uh, in the run game. Now someone texted in Frank and Margate says, man, you guys are making me realize Jordan Davis was a really bad pick. Is that That's not what we're trying to portray here, right? I'm not portraying that no, at all. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I just, I just think that people conveniently ignored a lot of things that were said. People resort to extremes, right? And I, we can get to this in there because I, I see one going on already to make an argument for something that they like. And always everybody was, wants to like the first round pick. So when we all pointed out, many of us in the media pointed out that Jordan Davis only played a very relatively few number of snaps compared to most defensive linemen at Georgia. You know, he was not on the field in the pass rush. The response to that was, oh, that's because Georgia's beating everybody by 50 or that's because they have eight great defensive linemen. Like it's almost because not because Jordan Davis, because of everything else. And that's not always the case. So I, I don't want people to resort to extremes. This is not a bad first round pick. He is a unicorn of, his, of an athlete. And the Eagles knew very well when they drafted him that they were going to have to control his weight, get him NFL condition, get him technique, techniqued up. And hope that, you know, all of that, that coaching and development combined with the athleticism that is just so unique is going to make him into a great defensive lineman. But it just doesn't happen day one. For some guys, it does, right? For some first round picks that are amazing from the day they get on the, f- the first day they get on the field. I don't think the Eagles ever harbored any visions that he was going to be a full time 60 percent, 70 percent defensive tackle from day one and just completely change a game. He was drafted like many draft picks are on what you expect to be when you are at your best. Yeah, I mean, listen, I guess the question off of that would be, what is the evolution of him this season as opposed to two to three years down the road? Is that a different player? Yeah, I think the evolution is, I do believe that they would like to be able to play him more as the season goes on. 
Um, he did play in multiple fronts. It wasn't just a 5-2 nose tackle against the Lions. There were times that he played the three technique, which is the Fletcher Cox role, or um, in a 440 front. So he showed versatility there. Uh, I, I, I'm sure like when we're talking next year or maybe the year after, you're talking about him being a bigger part of the pass rush uh, when they go to their nickel and rush the passer. Now, he might not come out with eight or nine sacks or ten sacks, but he may occupy two blockers and the guys around him are going to eat because of it but he will be a force he is he should be a force as long as he 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 turns out to be what they projected uh jeff mosher inside the birds.com the inside the birds podcast don't forget the inside the birds pregame and postgame show um what do, what do you make of the rpo was that what you expected that that, that looks like their offense like that's what they are right that's their offense it is their offense I, I could we could sit here and talk a half an hour about why it's their offense. Some people are not going to like the reason. Some people are going to take it as criticism when it's not. But it's their offense. The, the to break it down to you really easily, Mike is they they knew that this was going to be their offense once they knew they were coming back with Jalen Hurts. And it doesn't mean he hasn't improved because with the weapon added weaponry of AJ Brown and him being developed, they they feel like he can get from one to two reads now. Before he before he runs, it went, that's when he's a passer. By the way, um, that he can get to two reads, so he has developed in that regard. I mean, he was attacked relentlessly by the Lions. Not everybody is going to attack him that way, and he's probably not going to have to run as much as he did. But he will pro- he will run on his own as part of the RPO. There are times he's going to pull the ball out of Miles Sanders or Boston Scott's belly and run because he sees the opportunity there. And the reason why he doesn't run a conventional West Coast offense, the reason why they haven't built that around him or some um, Scott Turner, Norv Turner, four vertical, you know, deep offense is because he's not built for that. And that's not a criticism. There's not that many six foot, six foot one, you know, shorter quarterbacks playing behind immense offensive lines that stay in the pocket all the time and sit there and go bing, bang, bing, bang. His instinct will always be to run when the pressure Not as always on him, Mike, but even when the pocket is starting to pinch around him, Donovan McNabb could stand there and stand there and stand there, right? As that pressure built around and fire it into the middle and throw open a wide receiver because he has a cannon of an arm. Jalen Hurts can never have that arm, and that's not a criticism because not everybody has that arm. So the Eagles are building an offense that caters to his strengths. He was amazing as a runner against the Lions. I mean, he, he was as dynamic as you've ever seen him. And that's the way the offense is going to look. It's going to be him handing it off sometimes, him running sometimes, and him throwing the quicker patterns. Now, he did put one ball in the air deep to A.J. Brown. You'll get a few shots, but it's not going to be, you know, five, six, seven, eight shots downfield like maybe you'll see in a Justin Herbert or a Tom Brady or a diff- or Josh Allen offense. And again, not a criticism. I'll, I'll make this comparison because people always interpret that as criticism. You wouldn't take Derrick Henry who's, what, 245 pounds or something like that, and put him as a Brian Westbrook type of running back in a West Coast offense and ask him to line up in the slot and throw him the ball that way and throw him screens and ask him to get mismatches in the, in the passing game. Is that a criticism of Derrick Henry? Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> but there's not been that many guys built like Derrick Henry who are going to be that kind of player. And for Jalen Hurts, the theory is if this guy has the intuition and the instinct to run – why don't we do it? Why don't we build an offense where he runs on his terms, where he runs when the defense is in conflict because they don't know, is he running? Is the running back running? Is this a, is this a pass, right? As opposed to making him run when he's sitting there bouncing around the pocket and then the defense is converging around him and maybe he gets away, maybe he doesn't, probably takes a hit, you know, if he does. Like, they put the, the, the run in his game at his advantage by running that style of offense. So the last part of that is people will say, well, I don't know if you can win a Super Bowl like that. Well, I don't know if the Vikings can win a Super Bowl with Kirk Cousins, who's a conventional pocket passer. Like there's 28 teams that don't know if they can win a Super Bowl that way. Yeah. Right. I mean, how many guys are saying, I know I can win a Super Bowl because I have that quarterback who can play in any scheme. Four teams, five teams. Me, I don't know. Let me ask you this question. <laughs> I've been asking a lot of people this, you know, Hertz is up for a contract at the end of the year. Some yeah. crazy numbers have been mentioned of what he can make. 35, 40 million a year. Is that fair? I mean, you have to tell me what kind of season he has. Well, so, I mean, uh, I, this <laughs> is, uh, uh, well, that's the number that I've been. Hey, that's what a guy of his stature, in terms of where he is on the 
power rankings. Is he the 20th best quarterback, 25th? I don't know. But those guys are making $35, $40 million a year, these quarterbacks. If he plays the game he played on Sunday consistently throughout this year, are the Eagles signing him to a contract? Well, it's a, it's a, that's one of my extremist hypotheticals that I'm trying to avoid because there's no nobody ever plays the same game 17 straight weeks. Um, well, I'm saying if you – like, okay, you're right. They don't play the same game, but what you look for in your quarterback is consistency. And I get where you're going. You know what I'm I saying? I think like, it's the so biggest dilemma. If, if, I think it's the biggest unanswerable question, Mike. If he's, if he's good – but doesn't, you know, go two rounds deep in the playoffs. Like, what do you do? I, I don't know. Well, you know, like, I I don't know. I think you ha- a lot of factors are going to be, like, what's available? Who do they like compared to who he who they think Jalen is? Do they think that being really good this year was good? And I, there's so many factors involved there. Right? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, well, all right, let it's me always going to come down to, do they think that they can get somebody better? Okay, so if – Howie Roseman's apparently sitting in the room with uh, everybody, right? He's calling the plays now. But do you think Nick Sirianni, Howie Roseman, Shane Steichen, and Jeff Lurie sat in a room afterwards and said, man, that's our guy. I was really happy with what I saw. I think they were very happy with what they saw. I don't know that if you said, is that your guy for the next 10 years? They signed the, the contract on that. Okay. You know, I think that that's not – and that's not even a fair question. I mean, you've got – if they have a terrible game, if he has a terrible game against the Vikings, we could have the opposite question. Have they already decided he's not going to be the guy because he can't beat the Vikings? But then he comes back week three and cleans the clock of Washington, then we're back on the other. That's why it's like a long season, and um, we're not going to be able to answer that until we see the results of the season. Well, yes, and that's the whole – and look, we knew this going into the season, that this was going to be what Jalen Hurts was up against. Every week he's under the microscope to, to, to see if he's their guy because – at the end of this year, he's up for an extension. People say, right. why don't they just sign him now? And you, you can't. can't. Right. You can't right. sign him now. You have to wait till the end of this season. So he is playing for a contract. He is playing for opportunity to this teams. And he they have two picks. So he's got a lot against him going into every single week. He's going to be kind yeah. of broken down like this. And by the way, you know, like the – the idea that the I, I tweeted this earlier because again I hate extremist hypothetical arguments to make a point that that aren't necessary because I think Jalen Hurts played a really good game I think for what you just said what they asked him to do and what he had to do he didn't turn the ball over at all they relentlessly pressured him he was under duress a lot he had to run a lot he had so much volume with the ball whether he's running or throwing and he didn't he, four touchdowns were on the board so I think he played a really good game but I've heard this ridiculous assertion. That's not even necessary that the Eagles don't win that game unless they have Jalen Hurts. So they don't win that game without Jalen Hurts. Well, I'm sorry, but it doesn't we don't work in a world where the defense plays the same style of defense every game regardless of the quarterback. So who's to say that the Lions are throwing six, seven-man fronts at, Jail, uh, at the Eagles if it's a different quarterback? That's, that's not a fair remark to say because you have no idea what the Lions would have game-planned if it was a different quarterback for the Eagles. And then on top of that, you know, Joe Burrow is a, is a pocket quarterback for the most part. He doesn't run around. That guy got hit more than anybody, got blitzed a ton. I mean, he was under duress more than anyone last year, and he won a lot of games and went to a Super Bowl. So the idea that a, a, another quarterback can't negate pressure with really good, fast, smart throws, accurate throws, and that only Jalen Hurts could have is about as lunacy as <laughs> it's people trying to support Jalen Hurts when they don't have to. All you have to say is he played a great game. Yeah. No, he did play a good game, and you're right. That's a great point is the Lions maybe don't send the house at somebody else because they might not want to get him, you know, pick, getting picked apart. And, and you Yeah, know, they thought that they could just force him to make bad throws on the run, and he didn't. And he so. didn't, right. He didn't make yeah. a lot of bad decisions. That's what it came down to. Correct. Now, you might say it was a bad decision to tuck and run as much as he did. Maybe that, there was nothing there for him. I didn't get to see the all-22 so I don't know if he had hot guys open or did he just see blitz and take off because he saw the blitz coming and he saw a, a, a lane to get out. Look, that first drive of the game, the Lions go down to score. The Eagles are all out of whack. And on third and 15, he goes and gets a first down. Third and 11, I think it was, that he goes and gets another first down. Uh, he made some decisions that kept drives going. So 
Uh, we'll see. It's an, it's an ever-evolving situation there. The defense did not play great, but this is a different – look, just because the Vikings have better skill players, their offensive line is not nearly as good in the interior Correct. there, so this should be interesting. We'll talk more about it. Jeff Mosher is back on Monday uh, when we preview Eagles-Vikings with him. And don't forget, Andrew's here tomorrow. Adam on Friday, the Inside the Birds uh, podcast is out for Wednesday. Check that out on all the podcast platforms and the Inside the Birds pregame and postgame show. Uh, on uh, Now, are you doing postgame on uh, Monday night? Late? We are. We're burning the midnight Ooh, oil. Me, baby. Adam Kaplan, and Trey Thomas. Where is that? You guys do that from where? Home? We, right at, at the moment, we're doing it from our houses, yeah, as a live stream. But, um, you know, stay tuned. That, that show might, uh, might have a home. All right. Well, check that out on the Inside the Birds YouTube channel. And uh, that is after the Eagles and the Vikings on Monday night. All right, bud. All right, Mike, thanks. Good Jeff talk. Mosher, of course. Yes, very good conversation.